Okay, so welcome again. Here we are uh, with our Accented Philosophy podcast, um, and we are talking uh, for the second time now about sports. We had the previous episodes where we discussed the Olympics specifically um, and some of the ethical problems of the Olympics. And today we want perhaps to talk a little more generally about uh, the function of sports in society. My name is Andy. And I'm Ezekiel. Welcome, everyone. Okay, uh, and so when we talk about the, these big sporty events, um, mm -hmm. one question or one, one argument is always, you know, that they promote um, sportiness in society. One of the benefits of these big games is that they mm, connect populations with the idea of sports. But this mm -hmm. always seemed a little problematic to me. So how sporty are the Olympics actually and um, you could say something perhaps about the way they are conducted might be wrong or might be considered problematic um, which is this fixation on performance mm. and generally when we talk about the benefit of sport for populations we think of this broad kind of sport which is not competitive right it is uh, focused on your personal benefit and when you go to a gym you know even if you are a regular gym goer you're probably not focused on lifting more weights than the guy beside you but you are focused on improving your own health by doing particular things and not so much mm -hmm. in winning um, mm -hmm. but these big events seem to be very much concentrated on winning on on the three yeah. people who in the end stand on this little staircase yeah. and everybody else doesn't count so could you argue that this is a problem and and this is something that actually destroys the connection that people might have with the games yeah so well again last time we talked about competition the value of it and i do think it can be a little destructive to for some people but um you're right sports i think sports has a lot of value in general and it's not just about competition it's not just because it pushes you to be better than someone else usually so i am a gym goer um and usually what we say at the gym is that the competition is not between um members of the gym but it's between you and your past self it's it's about being better than you used to be right so i think this is usually a healthy um approach to to sports uh, but these big events don't really promote that so maybe they do promote that for the athletes i'm not saying the athletes are uh, having unhealthy approaches to sports they're probably actually very happy doing what they're doing and it's probably good for them well you know uh to compete and to win and, and a lot of them have a very good um you know perspective on that and they're not resentful when they lose and you know so but i don't know if for the spectators, it actually promotes anything good like that because the spectators cannot be in this situation where they compete between themselves now and themselves before, but they're just cheering for someone so that this person who represents their country and therefore themselves wins against the others. So I actually think the competition in the Olympics or all these big sporting events is more unhealthy for people watching than it is for people playing. Right. This is interesting with the competing with your previous self. I, I had never seen it like this, but it seems to, this gives you a whole new perspective on what a performance could mean. And this also in a way applies to what we are doing, you know, grading students. So uh, mm -hmm. when we uh, grade student performance or when the school system, you know, grades student performance, uh, we are generally seeing it uh, relative to other members of the class. So you have A and C, yeah. B and C grades, uh, while effort is personal effort is uh, generally underappreciated in our uh, grading systems. Mm -hmm. um, what you say, you know, the important thing is how good you are in relation to your previous self. This would translate, you know, in an exam, how high is your relative um, gain in performance to how you were at the beginning of term? 
or how you were, you know, yeah. in the previous semester. So it's yeah. it's an interesting thought. I would like to one moment, perhaps, you know, explore it, although it's not sports related, it's a little more general, but uh, th this idea, uh, should we grade performance in terms of personal improvement or effort, or should we grade mm. performance in terms of results, in terms of objectively measurable uh, high performance in relation to a, to an, a group? Um, so what, what is more hmm. just actually? Uh, I think uh, generally it should be about effort, individual effort, and not just about results. I think schools in general tend to be too result oriented. The problem with university is that we don't see students for a very long time. So it's very difficult to see, to evaluate their effort. And also we don't spend a lot of time with them talking or um, you know, looking at what the homework is like, don't really have that much homework, it's, it's different, right? So they just, they come to the lectures and they listen, they ask a few questions, maybe if they do, they leave, they write an essay, we grade the essay, it's really hard to track their progress. But when you work in, in primary school, in high school, it's, it's different because you spend more time with the students and you can actually do that. So I think in these kind of institutions, um, attention should be paid on, you know, the effort and the evolution of individual students instead of just the results. But uh, unfortunately, this is the system we're in, and you know, people need to have certain grades in order to go to certain schools. And and this is the the whole idea of meritocracy that we briefly mentioned. Um, then, because some people have these results that we have decided collectively are the best results, we assume that they um, deserve to be. Uh, to go to certain schools or to get certain jobs uh, but maybe they haven't worked that hard for that or maybe they you know they ended up having these results for different reasons than simply the effort they put in you know maybe they were smarter maybe they got more help you know there could be a lot of circumstances so uh yeah unfortunately we don't really pay enough attention on uh, what students individually do uh, it's probably yeah, there's the also point. a problem when you talk about university that um, many of our degrees uh, qualify you for jobs and some of these jobs are dangerous and so the qualification is actually also a system that society has to manage access to particular um, positions of power, right? Um, so you you train somebody to be an airplane engineer, and then you know your life when you fly an airplane is uh, to some extent entrusted uh, into the hands of this engineer. Uh, and so now, if you grade the, him for effort, and previously he was a totally rotten engineering student, and now he is a, a much less rotten engineering student, but still the worst of his class, uh, then you see that this is, causes a problem, right? So you don't want to to great people only for effort if at the end of this you're going to give them some objective position of power right then you need to yeah. actually look at the result is he good enough to be an, an airplane engineer um, yeah. regardless of the effort that he has put in exactly it. the, it's all diff it's different you know there you have certain kinds of jobs that you know do require certain results i agree um you, you could argue it's the same for, you know, being a teacher or a professor, you know, you need to have a certain amount of knowledge. Um, and yeah, so, but, but it really, really depends. And I, the thing is, if we push people uh, in the direction of making more efforts instead of reaching certain grades from early on, maybe they'll be more likely to reach these grades than if we just put the grade in and say, well, this is a target and that's what you need to get. And we don't really care how you get it. You just need to do that. Um, so maybe overall, uh, people would improve their levels if we focus on effort instead of result, results. Right. And now back to sports. I mean, it seems like sports are not actually... Um, among these jobs where an objectively good performance mm -hmm. is necessary in order to attain some power. I mean, it's not like a, an Olympic winner in skateboarding is going to do brain surgery or construct airplanes. So it seems like, mm -hmm. especially for sports, it's actually irrelevant um, what your results are. And it's much more yeah. 
interesting to see the relative improvement uh, and nobody cares in the end whether you have you know 12 seconds on 100 meters or, or 10 or 9 uh, because this doesn't give you any special power in society um so would this be an argument that we should perhaps actually really do sporting events much more with um uh, grading of effort rather than objective numbers yeah, I mean, it's dip, it's, it depends because usually events are competitive events. So it's, all, it's about winning. It's about who's the best. We don't really have events that are just about looking at a, an athlete performing something. Well, we do maybe in the case of like dancing or, you know, uh, it's not really a competition, right? It's a show. So you're just looking at something. Um uh, you know, uh, team sports and, and the Olympics again, it's, it's a bit different. So, we, I guess, we could shift our perspective and think of it as we think of dancing and just look at the performance and be like, well, this is good, this is amazing, um, must take a lot of efforts, and don't, and don't really think about like if, if this person is better than, uh, than the other. Um, and I think athletes, again, when they train themselves they have this approach of constant effort, which then um, is rewarded by a, a medal, by being better than others. But that's because they have focused on the effort more than the, the results initially. Okay, yeah, so this, this idea of um, not having this cutthroat competition, right? And, and dancing, you mentioned dancing, there are multiple of these soft, um sports um events mm -hmm. um there mm -hmm. is also ice skating or yeah. or uh, yeah. you know many of these things where it could be made more cutthroat you could say i mean it's interesting to think of, of sports that don't exist uh, a sport that doesn't exist would be to take some dancing routine and to say everybody needs to dance this thing and you have to do it as fast as possible and then we start measuring the seconds um, yeah. so we could transform uh, dancing into a competition thing where we measure seconds and then you get your medal by dancing this routine you know in yeah. nine seconds instead of 10 seconds but we don't do this right we there mm -hmm. we clearly prefer to um, enjoy the performance rather than yeah reduce it to one number and then the question is why are we unable to do it with other things why does running have to mm -hmm. be measured by seconds instead of let's say the gracefulness of yeah. the running performance can yeah you, uh, i'm not sure what the point is so i i, I Again, I don't think, there, obviously we're not saying there's no competition in dancing because before a dancer is able to perform on stage, there is a lot of competition. They have to be the best dancer. So I guess you could say the competition happens before, we just don't see it. And the goal is to, to you know, um, provide a good experience for the spectator. Uh, we, but yeah, I'm not sure why we don't think of other sports this way. Um, and... It's, yeah, it's mean, also we... not, it's not only the competitive, I mean, it is competitive, like you say, right? But mm -hmm. we have multiple uh, criteria. So when we mm -hmm. judge dancing, you know, you have these different criteria. They, I guess the judges, I mean, I don't know exactly how it works, but the mm -hmm. judges judge different things. They judge the difficulty of, of what is being danced and they judge the, the gracefulness and they judge how many wrong steps they take and the judge, you know, all kinds of things. Um, um so but when we judge other sports often there's only one metric there's one variable yeah so in running it is only the time and yeah. in uh, football it is only the goals so yeah. you don't get any points for playing graceful football or playing mm -hmm. good football or interesting or uh, even for teamwork right yeah. so one one you know proposal that comes to mind now to me and i'm not a sports uh, person so i don't know if this is ridiculous probably it is but the the idea would be why don't we introduce just more parameters um according to which we can judge sporting events that now have only one variable that is being judged 
Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be good to have, you know, 100 meter running judged according to gracefulness, uh, humor, um, uh, you know, um, speed, um, yeah. posture, uh, and perhaps the accompanying music, and, and then to make it into a more um, yeah. inclusive event or a more yeah, uh, I've never really thought of it, actually. And it, it makes sense. We could maybe rethink these conditions. Um, I I personally don't enjoy too much sports that are competitive because I don't really uh, see a lot of value in being, you know, uh, in cheering for someone so that they win against the others. I do pay more attention to, like, if sometimes I happen to watch the Olympics, uh, I'm, I can be fascinated by their performance. I don't really care if they win or not, but I look at the performance. So for example, I was watching gymnastic and this is incredible what they're capable of doing. And I'm, I'm very interested in that, but I don't really know who won. I, I don't really care about this. So I, I think a lot of people would be the same actually. And I don't really see why we wouldn't change that. But I mean, I do see that the world doesn't function this way and you know for economic reasons prestige reasons we need a winner uh we, you know and we need to you know sponsors uh you know pay for a winner invest in someone who's likely to win and this is it has become a business so this is why we need winners but uh, it could be different you're right yeah I, I didn't say that we shouldn't have winners but perhaps to have a, a richer way of judging the yeah. winner than just you know according to one variable um yeah. which also brings us um to this idea of of drug uh, abuse right so often sports yeah. uh, people are forced to um take performance enhancing drugs uh, because this field of sports is already so much, um, uh, you know, shaped by uh, people who are taking these drugs that you cannot compete yeah. if you don't take these drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, you know, what, what thoughts do you have about this taking drugs in sports? I mean, I know that you, you are a gym goer, right? And I know that it is even yeah. among uh, gym uh, customers in some um, particular sports, it is already a problem that you have these gym goers taking yeah. drugs to improve their performance in the gym. And, and this for young people might be a problem because they're introduced into this performance enhancing drugs. And you ask yourself, you know, what is the point of it if it's only a gym? It's not even the Olympics. It's, they're not going to win anything except their self-esteem from being the best. Yeah, so bodybuilding is particularly affected by uh, drugs, obviously. It's, so it, here you have to make a difference between someone who would take steroids, for example, for, you know, for personal use and because they just want to get bigger, um, and someone who's doing it because they're a professional bodybuilder and they actually compete. And if you are a bodybuilder, if you compete in certain categories, you will not win if you don't take steroids or some kind of uh, hormone replacement therapy or, or, or something like that. So um, you, it's so common in bodybuilding that you even have competitions that are natural bodybuilder competitions where they say to compete here, you have to be natural, you have to be tested. Uh, but it's different from the standard competitions where they don't mention anything and no one is natural. We call them natural. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's again about bodybuilding, bodybuilding is an odd one because it's not about how much you can lift, uh, what you can do at the gym, your performance. It's only about the way you look. Uh, it's how, you know, the muscles you have, the shape of your muscles, how little body fat you have, the veins that you have. It's also the pausing, also the music you choose. It's, it's a very interesting way of competing. Obviously, it requires a lot of work. It's not just you take steroids and then you, you end up being like Schwarzenegger. Absolutely not. Um, but it is extremely common. The problem is, if you want a chance to win in this category, you have to compete with others and because they all take the drugs, you have to take the drugs. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, I do think it has, it's 
it's unhealthy to take this kind of drugs. Uh, I think everyone believes that. I do think that a bodybuilder's lifestyle is quite unhealthy um, because they often do that. And they also go through a lot of uh, restrictions in terms of food to lose a lot of fat. It's not a sustainable way of living. Um, then about the um, athletes like who perform at the Olympics, uh, obviously it, it's about fairness, right? So for bodybuilding, you can assume everyone who's competing in that category is under drugs. So it's fair in a way. But for the, the Olympics, they're assumed to be drug-free. So if it happens that one is not, then it's a problem of fairness. Right. And so, But then we, we also need to distinguish different drugs, right? Because some yeah. drugs are clearly performance-enhancing drugs and others are not. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned this example of somebody taking marijuana. Yeah. And um, can you briefly say what the thought there was? Yeah, uh, so it's a uh, Shikari Richardson who um, was uh, who performed extremely well in sprinting. She's an American sprinter, and she uh, was really on her way to the Olympics. Everyone thought she would break, uh, you know, the previous record, and um, everyone was cheering for her because she she did so well uh, while applying. And um, she got tested. They all get tested for all kinds of drugs. And she tested positive for marijuana, and she was um, prohibited from perform from uh, participating in the Olympics. I think she got a suspension of a few months, maybe four months, which covered the time of the Olympics, so she could not participate. And um, every uh, so people were uh, some people were quite upset about this. They said, "Well, she she was um, <clears throat> very good, and also marijuana is not a performance enhancing drug." So the rule uh, makes no sense, they were saying. <clears throat> we should only uh, punish uh, athletes if they take this kind of drugs that gives them an advantage. So uh, yeah, people were saying the, need, the rule needs to change. Then you can also say that she was well aware of the rules. And she also said, uh, she released a statement saying, I knew what I was doing. I knew what the rules uh, were. I still made that uh, choice. I think she said she was particularly upset because of some personal issues. I think her mother had passed or something like that. Um, she was not justifying her uh, action. She was actually owning it. And um, yeah, you could say if you're an athlete, you know there's a lot of rules you have to follow. And if you break them, fully knowing you're breaking them, uh, you can't really blame the rule afterwards. But you can still discuss the legitimacy of the rule. You can think the rule is not uh, a good one in this case. Of course, this is what we're doing, right? I mean, we're not we're yeah. not talking about this particular person and her choices. Now yeah. we are trying to uh, talk uh, about, you know, which which drugs should be considered drugs and which should not be considered drugs. I mean, there, there are also these very obvious things like coffee. Um, that exactly. uh, again is a performance enhancing drug mm -hmm. right and just because it is so widely used um it would be silly to to have the olympics you know disqualify people who are drinking coffee yeah. um so it seems that there's also this, a social uh, aspect there right so what society considers to be um the drugs that should be avoided and and what are drugs that are allowed um for, for an athlete, you know, I imagine sugar, glucose might be a drug that um, is actually very valuable, right? If you can yes. uh, pop in some glucose because before you have your 100 meters, that this might give you an advantage. I don't know. Do they actually test for... For, but, uh, for uh, uh, blood sugar levels? I don't think they do. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe they test insulin levels. I'm, I, I'm really not sure, but this is a fair point. Sugar food is, is a form of performance enhancing substance. Okay. Uh, caffeine is a very good example. <laughs> you do not actually need caffeine to live, um, but you do need sugar. So, And then you have uh, these, these other manipulations, which are perhaps not directly considered drugs, but... Um, I thought of, you know, if you wanted to perform better in sports that require a lot of oxygen, let's say like like uh, long distance running or something, um, you could uh, 
train yourself by, by first, you know, walking up a mountain, you know, the Himalayas mm -hmm. and spending a few weeks there to get your um, a system mm -hmm. used to less oxygen and increase the number of your red blood cells. And then you go down and participate in this event. And then suddenly you have a huge advantage. And I think that there are uh, drugs like that also, right? That increase your um, production Possibly. of red blood cells. So, I mean, just manipulating your body in this way without even using a drug, you could do it mm -hmm. by just, you know, taking a Nepal a holiday mm -hmm. before the Olympics. Um, is this now a manipulation that is allowed or is it a manipulation that should not be allowed? Um, this is this is quite tough. And I think drugs, we have a specific view on drugs as a society. Uh, we think that drugs spoil an individual in general. We have this kind of collective idea. So if we take any sort of drug, we are not really ourselves. I think this is what we uh, think. It's it's odd that some of them get a pass, like like coffee, um, which is actually a drug and which does change your mood. But um, so these kind of things say, uh, get get a pass. But uh, I'm not saying we should change our view on drugs. But I th the view is currently that it makes us behave differently than our natural selves. We're not our natural selves when we do that. But if we go to the Himalayan and we improve our performance because of this, it doesn't really change who we are. It doesn't change our behavior or reactions. And maybe that's why we have no problem with this. Um, I think it leads to also the problem of uh, hormone levels in general, which is also a big problem in sports. Um, so you have, for example, for female competitions, you have women who have higher levels of testosterone than others naturally without taking any testosterone. And I, I remember a few years ago, uh, a runner was prohibited from um, <coughs> running, from competing because her natural testosterone levels were too high. So it was a disadvantage for the other runners, but at the same time, she took no drug and it was just the way she was. And then she could not uh, compete with the men, obviously, because the testosterone was too low, but too high for the women. So she, that was her job and her career and then what what could she do this is this is a very tricky question this this is a great example actually because if the um, uh, hormone levels of this person were entirely natural then you could say okay somebody who is born with longer legs perhaps as a runner also has an unfair advantage right then mm -hmm. why don't we regulate the length of the legs also and disqualify people whose legs are too long so you get into all kinds of problems there, what you want to allow and what you don't want to allow, right? So you, it, yeah. you, would, you would have to work towards measuring an ideal individual that is allowed to compete and everybody who falls outside of these ranges is not allowed to compete. Yeah. Um, and this also, of course, now brings us to this question, which we, we originally didn't intend to complicate things further, but um, there is obviously this problem of hormonal treatments um, and of trans athletes. And uh, at least, you know, we should very briefly mention it or perhaps, um, you know, perhaps try to say what the problems are there. So yeah. what, what is your um, own intuition um, regarding trans athletes and trans sports participants? Uh, one one thing would be to say, you know, they they are a category of their own. So we could have, you know, mm. uh, men, women, and then, you know, yeah. uh, another number of categories of people who are uh, physiologically different and therefore should compete among themselves. Yeah. Um, what do you think would be the just thing to do there? It's hard. Um, it's hard. It's a hard question. So there was the first transgender um athlete performing at the olympics um this this year um i forgot her name i think it's laurel um i'll i'll google it because i don't want to yeah cover. but it doesn't yeah. really matter so uh, much i mean we're not discussing individual no i just no problems, i know right yeah, we, we want to talk about the principle of it more right yeah yeah, yeah. uh so <laughs> 
so yeah, some people have argued that they should have their own category. Some people have said it's only about um, it's only a matter of hormone levels. So I do think it makes sense to test hormone levels because it, obviously, um, you know, a, a male um, athlete cannot just compete against a female athlete with like hormone levels that are completely different. Um, men are on average much stronger than women. This is a biological fact. But then when someone goes through um, hormone uh, changes, then everything can change, obviously. So I do think it makes sense to test them. And we could just stop there and just see if they meet the conditions hormone-wise. Some people argue that they, even when they do, they still maintain an advantage. Um, if let's say uh, they were uh, born male, because usually it works this way, uh, you have more advantage if you're if you were born male. So, but then we have to look at the results as well. So, for example, this particular athlete did not do particularly well. Um, in fact, I think she failed uh, her lifts. Uh, it was uh, Olympic weightlifting, and. So if it turns out, we don't have a lot of distance for this. If it turns out that transgender athletes absolutely crush uh, non-transgender athletes in their categories, then maybe we can rethink this. If that's not the case, <clears throat> then well, maybe the hormone level is enough. So. Yeah, but it seems it, it doesn't seem good as a way of regulating things to first see how they turn out and then regulate backwards, right? Um, it, it seems like this then is um, lack somehow a theoretical justification. We're just looking if we can live with the result, no matter whether the process is good or bad. Yeah. It seems like a rational regulation should should begin with some abstract principle that then mm. we regulate uh, and we accept the results, you know, because the results are following the abstract principle rather than the other way around. Um, a third so, category could be an option as well. Um, but yeah, I also don't know how do you, it's the same. The, a third category would also be subjected to hormone level measurements because obviously different transgender athletes will have, will have different hormone levels. Um, and then you have, you run into the same issue uh, also. Right. It, it seems a little reductive, right, to just um, uh, make the decision according to one hormone or, you know, perhaps a small number of them, um, because this overlooks all kinds of other differences, right? Is this, do you think this is a problem? I mean, um, it's, it's not only one hormone. Uh, it is that when you have been raised as a man, um, then perhaps you already, you know, you have grown as a man, let's say, then you have grown um, bigger muscles or bigger bones or whatever the physiological differences there are. And this stays with you, even if you now have a different level of this hormone, right? You, you still have particular advantages in size or strength. So that, that's what case? some people have argued. Um, <clears throat> but other people have also argued that these changes dramatically once you start taking different hormones and to be honest i i, I can't really say I, I don't really know i haven't really looked at the the numbers um you really have these two uh views on it um obviously it depends if the athlete has hit puberty before uh, take and uh, starting the treatment um and yeah i mean i could totally see how taking a kind of hormones can really um, reverse whatever process had been going on biologically. If that is the case, then, then uh, it should not be an issue. But again, apart from uh, hormone levels measurements, I'm not sure how to you know, evaluate because it's the same. Some, some women uh, who were um, assigned female at birth uh, still have more muscles than other women, you know, like some women are stronger than other women. Uh, so again, some are taller, some have longer legs. It's, it's, it's 
a bit the same for everybody, right? Yeah, so... are we chasing a, a wrong idea there, perhaps, of uh, absolute equality? Uh, yeah. I mean, it seems like often we we are a little misguided in our ideas of equality, uh, in that we perhaps it has something to do with utilitarianism with the idea that we are all just one unit of happiness or mm -hmm. our economic systems of capitalism mm -hmm. which again works uh, on this assumption that we are all just an, a number of um, some economic value uh, that is interchangeable and perhaps this has brought us to this point where we tend to judge people as being interchangeable um, yeah. uh, just you know and and totally equal in value and this is something you know to come back a little to philosophy which is supposed supposedly what we are doing here right uh, something aristotle for example would not agree with at all he would say people are not interchangeable because you are your virtues and you are your personality yeah. and you are the way you interact with the world and um we are not all the same. We are all entirely mm -hmm. different and specific. And, and this also is something that we say, right? We, we say that we should have respect for all these specifics and, and the inclusiveness of our societies. But on the other hand, we tend to value the idea that we are all exactly the same. And so this, there seems to be some contradiction there, right? I, if we are all the same, then what does inclusiveness mean? And if we want to be inclusive, yeah. then it means respecting the fact that we are actually different. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I definitely agree. And unfortunately, sports is still um, very archaic in, the, in, the, in this because it's, it's the place where we judge people the most harshly and everyone needs to be equal. Everyone needs to be the same. It makes sense in some ways because, again, because of this competition thing. Maybe if we dropped this competition aspect a little bit, we could actually enjoy sports, uh, you know, individually. So each athlete could just be, you know, uh, an athlete uh, be with what they have and because of what they have and not in relation to other athletes. And then we could allow more, you know, it would be much more inclusive. Uh, then you know but we impose these restrictions and maybe you're right maybe it has to be utilitarianism you can see a little bit the same thing in the marketplace i think in the workplace where people are treated like you know um you evaluate uh, people's cvs and they need to, to meet these conditions and you don't really look at their past their experience i mean you do look at their experience but it's only what's on the cv right and if it's the kind of experience you're looking for then it's okay if it's not then it's not okay you even have softwares that pre-check cvs to make sure the right words are on that so it's it's the same principle uh we don't really it's look a at good example because yeah. in in reality then everybody knows that when you have people actually working in this office environment there are many qualities that make one worker better than another right yeah. uh, exactly. more social or more you know better for the work climate more reliable more you know trustworthy mm -hmm. um, and all these are these soft qualities that are not immediately obvious uh, from the cv so we are judging people according to qualities that are not so relevant while we ignore uh, the more relevant qualities that later um are shown more prominently when the people yeah. actually work for the company so there's some problem there right we're selecting for the wrong things exactly and we don't look uh, at individuals as as a whole and what they can bring uh you know so and sports is is a good illustration of this again i don't want to say sports are bad and i do think there's a value in in watching sports and obviously doing sports um but we probably have to shift our perspective okay okay so now let's go over to the to the next topic what you just mentioned you know the spectator so the the yeah. one of the arguments always for these big sports events is that this will motivate people to do more sports or will be good for the spectators or for the public image of sport but then uh, you know when you see these events uh, and how they are um watched by the audience the audience is just sitting on the sofa eating you know chips or crisps depending on where they are uh, uh watching this 
And it ends up being, you know, a totally unsporty experience for most of the people, except for the yeah. for the people who compete in the Olympics themselves. Everybody else is just sitting there and getting fatter and fatter and less and less sporty. So is there any evidence that actually these big sporting events um, contribute to the health of the population? Um, do you think that this is a valid argument or is this just an excuse? I think generally it doesn't really change much the life of people who watch. Maybe for a minority of people, they look at the Olympics and they think, oh, this is great. I should get in shape. And they actually do that. Uh, most people don't. And it's the same for all sports. So I don't think it is good for society in terms of inspiration. Um, maybe there is a value in the getting together thing, what we mentioned uh, last time. Uh, reuniting around something, uh, which is something we seem to need in society. We have always needed to gather and cheer for something. That's not necessarily um, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, you know, we can cheer for someone to be decapitated, like to beheaded. That's that, that's also a possibility. Um, but we still we seem to need this as human beings. So sports can be, um, uh, you know, a platform for common collective values. So I think there is kind of a, a value here. Maybe it could be the value of, you know, sharing or fairness or effort or work. You know, it can be that. And we can all get together and cheer for that. Then it can also bring about a lot of negative passions like, you know, nationalism, pride, uh, aggression, uh, you know, hate towards uh, the, uh, your rivals. So you have to be very care careful with this. But I don't want to say that sports necessarily is negative in this sense. Um, right. Yeah, but so I don't think it has... Um, it, it, this is a problem, right? Like you say, with the nationalism... Um, I never understood why we need to divide sports teams by country. I mean, this seems to completely counteract the idea that um, the game should be something that overcomes these divisions and emphasizes our common humanity. If I want to, to emphasize the common humanity, why do I say, you know, this is the Korean team and this is the German team instead of saying, you know, these are individuals who compete? Yeah, because we're full of paradoxes. <laughs> We, uh, it doesn't really make sense. I also don't really understand the justification for cheering for someone from your country because it's accidental. Uh, you happen to come from the same place. It doesn't mean anything, obviously. So why would you be uh, proud of something that's ex accidental? Um, that is- Okay, this odd. might not be entirely accidental to say it has to do with um, the way a country promote sports right the way a country gives um, money for sports for sports education for training for public venues and so on and I can be proud that my country is a country that supports um, creating this ability in its population to win these competitions where other countries don't do that yeah then cheering for your country's ability to um, come up with these high quality athletes is actually uh, yeah, a, better, a better argument. And maybe this is a healthy way of seeing it. Um, it could also be that a, son a sense of belonging that you share with the people you share a citizenship with, which can have some value. I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong that any form of nationalism or patriotism, let's call it patriotism, is necessarily wrong. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I've left my country. I, I don't necessarily interact with a lot of uh, French people wherever I am, but uh, I do feel like I belong there as, you know, I, I will always belong there because this is where I was born and when I was, where I was raised. And in virtue of this, I share certain values with, with you know, my fellow French people. Uh, I 
a certain way of looking at life and we don't agree on everything but uh there is it's a community and i i think this can be a healthy feeling it, it could be a, a nice way to get together um so yeah we could cultivate that instead of cultivating the competition aspect again um and cheering for your community and for the sharing that goes with that instead of cheering for someone against others right uh, there was also an, a last thing perhaps um because again we are running out of time yeah. um i read an article in the times uh, that uh, questioned this this aspect of complicity through watching because we talked mm -hmm. last time about how many moral problems the olympics create in terms of poverty or um environmental uh, problems and now this article was discussing the question are the viewers actually responsible for the harm that the olympics cause because in the end, this whole thing happens because of the viewers. And if the viewers were not yeah. there and they were not present, then nobody would go into the trouble of creating the Olympics because yeah. all this uh, advertising income would not be there. Um, so we are, yeah. in a sense, as viewers, collectively responsible for the harm that comes from the Olympics. Uh, can we say this or is there a way to excuse um, this participation, this complicity? Yeah, I think if you really truly feel that something is wrong, uh, it's not a bad idea to boycott it uh, when you can, whatever that is. So by not watching the Olympics, by not ordering on Amazon, if you think Amazon is not a good uh, company. Um, but I also don't think the responsibility should be on the viewers only. I think it's a very small portion of the problem. Sure, if no one watched, it wouldn't exist. So I think boycotting has some value and we should probably do more of that. But we also should not be blamed for decisions that we have not made. And um, the fact that we, we then watch the Olympics because, well, they're here, so we may as well, uh, does not make us responsible for the fact that the Olympics exist. I, I think it would be uh, taking this problem in, a, in, in the wrong way. Right, we could, we could take, for example, the ancient Roman gladiator fights mm -hmm. as, um, as an illustration that is a little more uh, pronounced where you say okay I have this game there the, the slaves fighting against the lions and being eaten and this is clearly an immoral kind of uh, yeah. spectacle there and you have all these viewers sitting in the stadium yeah. and enjoying this and this is um, a heightened you know contrast uh, but similar in, a, in its effect so would we blame the individual spectators for the gladiator fight that is going on there and again, obviously, uh, they are participating in this, right? They, they are mm -hmm. the reason why this happens. If, if nobody liked this, this wouldn't happen. Yeah. Like it doesn't happen today because we don't like this anymore. Yeah. Um, but I, it is I hard to say that blame... every individual is to blame, right? Yeah. So I would not blame the people for the existence of the games, but I would blame them for going to the games. So the fact that the games exist is maybe not their responsibility, but then they don't have to engage with it. So I would blame, I would think it's immoral to actually go when I don't think it's immoral to watch the Olympics, although I think the Olympics pose a lot of moral issues. So, so why is that difference? Yeah, then? what is the difference? I'm trying to think. Uh, I think there's, there's, there are levels of immorality, right? I think some things are more immoral than others. And I think in the case of the Roman games, there's clearly nothing good in it. You can't, I don't really know if you can come up with any justification for them. When I can see some value in the Olympics, I, I, I'm not saying athletes are wrong in doing that. I think they do incredible things. Um, I think we should support athletes in general. Um, so I do think sports has a value and the athletes themselves are not directly hurting anyone when they do what they're doing. So 
but I'm not against the boycott either. If someone told me they're boycotting the Olympics, I would respect that. I would understand their point. I do think it's, however, a little different than Roman games because of the content of what's um, provided. Uh, On the yeah. other hand, you could argue that the total amount of harm does done by the Olympics is much higher than that um, of the Roman game in which you kill 10 slaves who are already not having a very good life. And perhaps some of them will also win and be uh, then, you know, freed and uh, have a better life. So, you know, it's a small number of lives there uh, at stake. While in the Olympics, you have a much bigger effect, especially an environmental economic effect that affects millions of people. So uh, just because yeah, it is more hidden, does it make it you know, better? Or? No, definitely not. But I'm also not a utilitarian. So I don't think uh, you can weigh things this way. Um, maybe more lives are affected by the Olympics than by the Roman Games. But you don't actually kill people in the Olympics when you do in the Roman Games. And I do think it's worse to kill people than to evict them from their houses, although it is wrong to do so. So it's all about the, con the action itself and not the consequence of the action, the impact on the population, um, because I'm not a consequentialist. Right. But we can probably agree that as, you know, more generally as consumers in this society, we do have some responsibility um uh, about what happens with this society right because this yeah. is a consumer driven society and so yeah uh, as consumers we should take of this more seriously yes okay yeah. so uh thank you that that was it uh, again and uh, we hope to see you again for our next topic uh yeah. which i think should be meritocracy right is it because this yeah let's let's talk about this and this idea we, we keep mentioning and let, let's dig into it okay so then um <laughs> see you next time bye bye from me see you next time thank you bye bye <laughs>